Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show. All this week, we are bringing you our hot crime summer shows. Today, a deep dive into the Jody Arias case. This month marks 15 years since Travis Alexander was viciously murdered by his ex-girlfriend Jody Arias. We revisit the case with criminal defense attorney and longtime Kelly's court contributor, Mark Eiglarsh. We'll take a look back at the events leading up to Travis's murder, what Jody's life is like in prison today, and Mark will dissect the defense and prosecution in a way that only Mark can. Hey, subscribe to the show on YouTube and follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Some people take CBD for better sleep or less stress or more calm. Some take it for pain relief, better energy, or better focus and concentration. Today, I want to tell you about CB Distillery and their over 2 million satisfied customers. According to a poll of their customers, 90% reported they do sleep better with CBD. 81% say CBD helps with stress, and 80% say CBD helps with aches and pains after physical activity. If you struggle to get a good night's sleep, if you're dealing with too much stress and you could use a little calm in your life, if you suffer with pain and discomfort, especially after physical exercise, you could give CBD a try from cbdistillery.com. Use my 20% discount by visiting cbdistillery.com and enter my initials MK for your discount. No prescription required. That's cbdistillery.com, promo code MK for 20% off, cbdistillery.com. I'm going to kick it off with a little walk down memory lane because you used to come on Kelly's Court back then as now. This one doesn't involve you. This Kelly score doesn't involve you, but it's a scene setter. Now we're 10 years post verdict right now. Here's a little flashback to, I was on the air when we got the guilty verdict and covered it with uh, the court then, which was Mercedes Colwyn that day and Jonas Spilbor. Look at this sweet delivery. She's so concerned about their happiness and their peace now. Listen. I hope that now that a verdict has been rendered that they're able to find peace some sense of peace. That's great. And the Oscar goes Beautiful. to oh my God. because Wait, this ah. is a woman who stabbed him 27 right. times in the heart uh, as well, then shot him. And look at the bloody sink. I'm not to be sensationalist, but prosecutors say the man was standing at the sink watching himself get stabbed to death, watching himself get murdered and bleed out over over the sink. Oh, but Mercedes, she's so concerned about the family's peace. Give me a break. Hey. Okay, a very pregnant Megan Kelly in that clip. But that gets to it, right? I mean, the thing, because I've been asking myself, Mark, what is it about the Jody Arias case that keep, that kept people so riveted? And in part, it's this mousy little woman who committed one of the most heinous murders that ever came before the national eye. You, you left out one thing, which is obvious, and maybe you intentionally did it, but Americans like pretty packages, okay? If she wasn't pretty, and I put that in quotations, I mean, it's not how I feel, but there is some type of objective, you know, in Hollywood, what people look for. People found that she was attractive. And if she wasn't and she looked differently, I don't know if people would have been as interested. So let's Mm. let's bring that out. That's that's gotta be something that you concede, right? And the sex, I mean, it was like, an R-rated trial. It was like Cinemax back in the day. Oh, yeah. No, there was a lot of that. Yes. And and she really threw punches. I mean, she really, you know, dead man can't tell tales. He was dead. She was free to say whatever the hell she wanted. So whether it be, you know, allegations of him being involved in kitty porn, which he can't defend, um, or, or or him wanting to do, which really was documented because you heard those horrible um, audio tapes of him, you know, some of the things he would do to her, which weren't meant for public viewing. It was just horrible. Mm. All right. So let's start. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, these two meet in 2008, I think it was 2008 at a business convention and um, 2006, sorry, to September. These two meet in September, 2006 at a work conference in Las Vegas, Nevada, Jody Arias and Travis Alexander. And well, then they start dating out a few months after that. As far as I can tell, Mark, they were only dating for like four months, but then oh, yeah, continued to they, they, they she continued wants, to sleep but, with know, each other. 
Yeah, it, it sounds like it became very physical very quickly. And, you know, she's the manipulative type, right? So I can't imagine this was pure love. I think this was lust. I think this was her, you know, playing the angles, looking to manipulate him. And she jumped all in real quick. Did we have any evidence that prior to that relationship, because I think she was like 28, he was a couple years older than that, that she was some sort of a psycho, that she had, you know, problems with other partners in turning into a stalker or any other criminal history? I don't remember hearing anything like that. I heard little stories, but, you know, everybody comes out of the woodwork on high profile cases. Nothing that I attributed as credible and believable. So he was a Mormon and she wasn't until after she met him, right? Right, right. right. She became a drive through Mormon. You know, all of a sudden I'll convert. I'm sure that was, you know, again, to somehow take one step further into his good graces. So they 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 meet. Uh, yeah, here she is getting her, you know, I don't know. Is it a baptism into the Mormon face? I'm not exactly sure how we would refer to this. But they date from February of 2007 to June 2007. And then they break up and maintain a physical relationship. One year later, one year later, she appears to stage a burglary at her oh, yeah. grandparents' house. This would become important because it was one week before the murder. And what happened in that burglary? Yeah, next level stuff. She's thinking, okay, they stole a gun from my grandparents. So that gun's out there in the criminal world. So that's the gun, however, she'd like to use to potentially execute her boy. This is relevant because she would later claim when she was on trial, a bunch of different things, intruders, accident, self-defense, and if she intentionally staged a burglary at her parent, her grandparents' house a week before the murder, then it's very clearly a premeditated act. Absolutely. The best she's got is, well, I brought it with me for protection. I was going on the road, whatever. I didn't mean to kill him. I had it with me. doesn't necessarily mean she wanted to kill him, but it's strong evidence of it. But I got to go back. There's something that's bothering me. and It'll bother me tonight, Megan. I had brought out that she has a pretty shell to many people. Did you concede that? Is she what you would call attractive? And I'm not talking about her soul. I'm not talking about, I'm just saying, don't you think that that played a role in why people cared so much, why the media yeah. was so Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, if you That's have an attractive defendant okay. or okay. victim. I mean, okay. I think she was prettier when things started. And then when she took the stand, when she was at trial, she tried to make herself look very plain Janey, mousy, sure. you know, sure. but like the blonde and, you know, the okay. naked pictures, obviously she's got a, a very good body. All yeah. those things play into, oh, what's happening there? What, right. what, that kind of a person, right? All right, I got so, what I needed. You can move along. I got it. I just needed okay. to know that. Okay. Okay. So the date of that burglary was May 28th, 2008. June 2nd, 2008, which is now two days before the murder, she rented a vehicle from Budget Rent-A-Car in Redding, California. And then on June 4th, 2008, Travis Alexander was killed in Mesa, Arizona. So, I mean, to me, this does all look like premeditation. She looks like a jilted lover who became a stalker, who became obsessed with him. We're told that in, I think, April, right before the fake burglary at her grandparents' house, he was going to go with her on some trip. That. Right? And then that. he bailed. Cancun. Everybody wants to go to Cancun, baby. And then he, she thought she was in the money. She was going to go with him. It's going to be romantic. He's going to really spend the dough on me. He's going to, he's going to, it's going to be romantic. And he picked another girl. That was it. Mm -hmm. And that Man. really can be the catalyst for a lunatic. Like you never know what's going to set some crazy stalker off. Sure. To, to the it'll, point it'll of murder. disappoint any normal gal who has strong feelings for someone for whatever reason. But when you take someone who's, you know, got 51 cards and isn't all there, that can really amp it up. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's as near as we can tell, like one of the last final acts he does that gets in her head somehow. But they had been on again, off again with the sex after breakup. So, you know, who knows how this exactly files in. June 4th, 2008. That's the day of the murder. Uh, and we'll get to what happened that day. But weirdly, his body was not found for another five days. Why? Do we know why that was? Like, 
Did he not have a job? Did he not have friends? How do you sit in your, you know, how is it that a body's five days in the apartment without anybody noticing? Yeah, it was like that. I, I'm trying to think of the specifics, but they he was supposed to be somewhere and then they checked in on him. I think a friend did. Finally, he wasn't there. But yeah, I don't think he had any place that he had to be. He didn't have roommates. He didn't have nosy, you know, uh, parents coming around. So yeah, it just happened. Wow. All right. So the day of the murder, June 4th, what happened? She she goes over there and what happened? Oh, I don't know. Meaning, you know, we have what was alleged by the prosecution. Uh, the jury found her guilty. You, you never really know exactly what took place. Um, but what it looked like was um, she had a plan to execute him. And that's exactly what happened. She tried to defend with he was attacking me. And that was malarkey. I, initially, though, I think she was on Inside Edition and, and told a few people I wasn't there. I was framed like the Mona Lisa. I had nothing to do with it. And then when the evidence comes out, like most of my clients do, they go, oh, wait, you got that evidence? OK, 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 OK. I was there, but <laughs> that's what happened. So. Initially, you know, the murder happens on June 4th. She leaves. We we know. I mean, she winds up confessing on the stand. We know she did this crime now. Right. Um, but she left the crime scene. Yeah. No one finds Travis until his friends realize, like, he, he's not showing up at events, et cetera. And they go to his house. They, the friends, find his body in a crumpled heap in his shower an incredibly bloody crime scene and call 911. Here's a bit of that call. Stop Hello. Me. Hi, so what's going on? He's, uh, he, he's dead. He's in his bedroom okay. in, in the shower. Okay. How did this happen? Do you have any idea? No, we have no idea. Everyone's been wondering about him okay. for well, a few said, days. She said that there is blood. So is it coming from his head? Did he cut no, his I, it, I, It's all over the place. Hmm. And right away, Mark, the friends suspected her. They they described her to the authorities as, as a potential stalker. And that's what yeah. Travis had been saying about her. But they did have sex that day, right? I mean, like, it appears that they had hours and hours of some sort of sexual interlude prior to the murder. That's what's so unusual. Listen, you know, this guy clearly was a guy with strong emotions, which is the nicest thing I can say about him in terms of that. And, you know, they went at it. And my guess is, there were some discussions. Maybe that was her way of trying to convince him to pick her and replace the gal that he did select for Cancun to go, I don't know, but something happened and she snapped if, if she didn't plan on doing this anyway, no matter what. Because you have hours, and we know this because the, they found a camera. The, the two had been taking pictures of the oh, yeah. sexual acts. There's pictures of her posing totally nude for the camera, I mean, very consensually, does not look like a forced situation on either end. So for Wait, sure, and it looks like it that? went on for hours. What, I gotta know. What, what do you make of that? In other words, I want to know what you think. They're, why are they having sex the next minute she's executing him in a horrible, horrible, tragic way, which we're going to get to. But why do you mm -hmm. think, what's the sex about? What do you think? I think it was like a goodbye gift from her to him, though he didn't realize that's what it was. I think he thought it was just genu a genuine hookup. And I think she had this whole thing planned. She went there to murder him. And this was her farewell, you know, send off to the guy. Oh. I do. That's why she's a sick effer. And so I think she had the whole thing oh. planned out. And this was, there's no other reason. Okay. That is just cold as ice, baby. Wow. That's her. Okay. That's what's interesting okay. about her. I mean, from a, oh, you know. That's, I never thought Humanity about that. perspective. Like why, She's, in fact, in my mind, I couldn't wrap my head around that theory. And so I then thought, okay, she's got it just in case, whatever. And then things go awry. And then she kills him, either second degree or she just said, okay, it's part of my plan that I'm now going to implement. And she had time to think about it when she's there and she does it. But I don't know, man. You think she knew she was going to kill him? prior to having sex with him? Yes, I do. I think the whole thing was planned out in great detail. But she's a bad murderer. I mean, she's a, she was effective at, at committing the murder, but very bad at covering up her tracks. And mm -hmm. she should have spent more, more time in the planning and the lying phase because she turned out to be a disaster at that. Now, she 
very shortly thereafter gets arrested. The friends are like, it was it was Jodi Arias. She's a stalker. Meanwhile, the day after the murder, she went and saw another love interest, some guy named Ryan Burns, a former coworker of her of his of hers in Utah. That guy, yeah. I think he also took the stand. It's like that's how cold she is, Mark. Like she now at this point, there's no doubt she committed this brutal murder the day before. She goes off to see another lover. Oh, no problem. I mean, like. Just, yeah, consistent with what you were saying, like to be able to have sex with 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 this guy before she she kills him. You know, there's Travis. All right, he's dead. She she seems to just manipulate. And this is also what I know after the fact. I'm jumping ahead of how she manipulates everybody in prison and stuff like that. But that seems to be her M.O. I don't know that type of person, but someone who who can't have an honest relationship and it's all about manipulation. So she probably had numerous fellas in her life, including the guy you just mentioned, where, OK, on to him. What do I need from him? Let me manipulate him to get it. Mm-hmm. And they tend to be narcissistic uh, personalities, right, who yeah. it's all about them. You only matter to the extent you reflect off of them. You cannot leave them. You certainly cannot dump them the way Travis did with Jody. Um, and that's why you can't process it as a normal person because we normal people don't react that way when they get dumped. It's sad, but we don't kill anybody. So she goes to see Ryan I'm Burns. And then, Wait, let me tell you this. Yeah. That type of person gets very misunderstood because the average juror who's arguably like you and me, you know, who's got sensibilities, uh, the right moral compass, who goes to work every day, kids, family, normal, they come in and they're trying to analyze the actions of some of these people. And a lot of times like, well, wait, that doesn't make sense. I wouldn't do that. There's no way that happened. That, I, I couldn't have done that. Even with the Murdoch trial, to this day, I know he killed his wife and kid and OJ killed. You know, it's hard for me to actually see it because it's so foreign to me and what I would do and what the average juror can wrap their heads around. Well, that plays into the brutality of the crime because mm-hmm. you, you look at this beautiful, tiny woman And you do not think she would be capable of this. You know, you see like two big muscly men with the tats in the prison in their background. And you think, oh, okay. Teardrops from the eye. Yeah, the tattoos. Yeah, Yeah. you see Jodi Arias, you think, no, because the level of violence that went down at this crime scene was unbelievable. 27 stab wounds, a slit throat, and a gunshot to his face. And the medical examiner testified that the the actual like slicing was extremely deep, three to four inches deep uh, into his neck. I'm trying to find the exact um, the description of it, but it was absolutely merciless. She yeah. she nearly decapitated him while he was in that shower. She clearly went in there while he was showering, and nearly decapitated him. Stabbed him twenty seven times, and then the medical examiner said after that, shot him in the face. So, I mean, the level of anger behind that, Mark, speaks to what? I mean, I don't know. What do we we glean from the level of violence? It goes back to what I keep trying to do in my head, maybe as a defense lawyer, as a compassionate soul, to believe that something went down before that happened, that he said something that set her off, I, I find it hard to believe, although I'm not relating to this type of person, that she, and this is probably what she did, that she had the whole plan. And this was, as you say, her goodbye love session. And then I'm going to get him in the shower. And she did. It just seems more consistent with someone who was set off by some words or action. How can that be? Okay, but how can that be? Because we've seen the crime photos. And, and among the photos that they found on the camera, which she left behind, right. um, is there are photos of Travis in that shower. And it appears to be after the lovemaking, you know, he's in the shower, he's not wearing his clothing. And that's, of course, we know he, where he was killed. And he's okay. There are yeah. photos of him in the shower, he's okay. So you don't have a fight. I mean, like he, an errant word from the shower as she was photographing him naked after their lovemaking, that doesn't make I'm sense. My theory makes much more sense. No, it might. I, again, I'm I, listen. I'm not defending this woman at all. I'm just no, saying, I know. as a human being, I'm just opening up and telling you how it's still hard for me to wrap my head around what she did. It's so challenging, and, and it's hard to understand how she, this life thin little thing, yeah. yes. could could kill him, could kill a, a man. He wasn't overly large, but he was bigger than she was. 
Sure. And how do you stab a man 27 times? I mean, he was in the shower, I guess. So he's vulnerable and he's not expecting it. But I mean, if that, if that yeah. you know, slice across the neck was number one, then that would have been the end of it. And it, pro- and it probably wasn't. I think the medical examiner said that those defensive wounds on his hands likely came first, which would make sense. She, he's caught off guard. He goes like this. She continues to stab. Um, but you just said it. He's off guard. He doesn't expect it. He's vulnerable. He's got nothing to defend himself except a bar of soap. You know, what do you do? She she oh she knew what she was doing and she's passionate and aggressive and 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 wanted it done. And then to shoot him after the fact, as Emmy said that he didn't see a brain hemorrhage from the bullet in right. Travis's head. And he said there would be if if the bullet had gone in there while he was alive and his blood was pumping. So she shot him. She just made sure, you know, he was 100% dead. She wanted this guy dead. She was very angry with him, which again suggests, I think, my theory. You know, she was angry. She was dumped. She was angry she wasn't going to Cancun. You don't yeah. dump somebody who's a narcissistic sociopath like Jody Arias. And the whole thing was a setup. That's, you know, that seems uh-huh. to be what the evidence suggests. I agree. I just, I just cannot relate. It's going to take me some time to process. Probably tonight as I'm laying down, writing my gratefuls. Wait a second. She had sex with him as a goodbye. Megan said that, and I trust Megan. I believe her. And then executes him in the most violent manner. In other words, after stab number 16, that apparently wasn't enough for her. You know, it required another few jabs. Right now we're at 21, 22, still not enough. I need about six more. And then I'm going to slash his throat and shoot him. You really do have to think about what she actually did to appreciate how abhorrent this was. My God. And then and then leave his crumpled dead body in the shower like he was trash. Mm-hmm. Um, she did get arrested a month and a couple of days after the act. Uh then more bizarre behavior came out. I'll get to the interrogation room, but she gave an interview to Inside Edition. Mark's number one advice to all of his clients, do not talk. Shut up. Let me do the talking if there's going to be any talking. She talked. The fish fish who kept his mouth shut never got caught, right? That's right. Um, That's right. and, and, And I'm not saying that certain interviews aren't beneficial, we, I've done it in many cases, but that's after you know what the evidence is, you know the parameters, you know how you can and can't get hurt. What she did was just reckless. So she gives an interview to Inside Edition, which actually makes some sense knowing her in the way we do. She did. She she was a narcissist. She wanted to be a star. She cared about how she looked, how people were perceiving her. Um, I think she was seeing an opportunity to like see her name in lights as opposed to just like, oh my God, keep yourself out of bars. Um, Here is a bit of what she told Inside Edition. This is well before the trial after she'd just been placed in jail. Did you kill Travis Alexander? I absolutely did not kill Travis Alexander. I had nothing to do with his murder. I didn't harm him in any way. I witnessed um, Travis being attacked by two other individuals. Who? I don't know who they were. I couldn't pick them out in a police lineup. So what happened? Um, they came into his home and attacked us both. You did not shoot Travis? No, I've never even shot a real gun. You did not stab him 27 I've never, times? No, that's, that's heinous. Or I've never, slit his throat from ear to ear? I can't imagine slitting anyone's throat. No jury is going to convict me. Why not? Because I'm innocent. And you can mark my words on that one. No jury will convict me. Oh, oh man. Oh man, man, so, we could we could have we could do an hour just on that. There is so right? much there. Right. So wait, all right. So let me just go. First of all, yeah. the one thing she asked for was for makeup prior to her mug shot. That's what she's mm-hmm. thinking about, right? Right. I'm not thinking about a life of of having to never take a shower ever again in a in a jail or prison because you know I'm too pretty. She's worried about her mug shot. She needs to to mix. There we go. She needs it is to a stop. nice mugshot. So it goes lie. to the point how she's so narcissistic. She wants the world to love her and, and believe that she's, you know, Snow White. But look at the way she acted. This is why you never know anyone. You just know how they want you to see them. Because she looks believable. If you know nothing about the facts of the case and you look and you go, yeah, how could she have done that? So beware, folks. I, you never really mean 
I watched that interview, Mark, and all I can think of is Phil Houston, the human lie detector, CIA guy who invented the deception detection method that's still used there. He was at CIA for 25 years. And what he talks about, I'll set it up for you. I'll play it again. But listen to how, okay, she does a couple of the things, convincing behavior. If I say to you, Mark, did you kill this guy? You say, no. You don't try to convince me you would never kill anybody. That's that's not what a normal non-killer does. Um, so the convincing behavior, the deflecting behavior, the qualifying statements, the trying to convince you she's a good person. Listen, listen to it again, understanding those are signs of deception. Did you kill Travis Alexander? I absolutely did not kill Travis Alexander. I had nothing to do with his murder. I didn't harm him in any way. Right I witnessed um, Travis being attacked by two other individuals. Who? I don't know who they were. I couldn't pick them out in a police lineup. So what happened? Um, they came into his home and attacked us both. You did not shoot Travis? No, I've never even shot a real gun. You did not stab him never 27 shot a gun. times? Never, ne that's, that's heinous. Or I've never. slit his throat from ear to ear? I can't imagine slitting anyone's throat. No jury is going to convict me. Why not? Because I'm innocent. And you can mark my words on that one. No jury will convict me. Classic. That's heinous. That's convincing. No, uh, I can't imagine ever slitting someone. Who says that? You wouldn't say that. You'd say, no, no, I didn't do it, period. Listen, in retrospect, you see all these signs. You don't really see it up front. But she did, you know, listen, there's one thing that she did say that really bothers me. And I know it's probably for other cases. But when I can't stand when people blame other people for their crimes. And worse, mm -hmm. I actually think there should be an enhancement, a penalty enhancement when you pick somebody of a certain race. Or no, gender. it's always like, oh, like black man. Case, it it is. was two Latina women who did this, or it was two black males who, I can't stand that. All right, I'm done. Yeah. No, it happens all the time. Yeah, two Latino women. Who was that? That was the blonde lady, the, the wife who staged her own disappearance. What's yes. her name? You so now, were thinking so about this. So how many... How many Hispanic Latina women are stopped and questioned and harassed in that area because of what she said, right? I can't stand Well, at least Jody Arias said, I, I couldn't pick them out of a lineup. Like, don't bother. <laughs> don't worry. We won't. Oh, <laughs> Sherry Papini. Sherry Papini was the one that Give her credit said the for two not Latinas. wasting precious judicial um, and, and um, law enforcement resources on her trying to identify someone. Give her credit for that. Yes. Okay, so she gives that BS interview. I mean, it's so weird. And and you can take it right now. I'm not going to be convicted. What the hell? This is not a sports game. Like, just this is a crazy person sitting there, though not legally. But on the subject of craziness, there was video of her in the interrogation room at the police station doing a headstand. And I want to ask you, why, why did she do this? They left her alone in the interrogation room. For the listening audience, she goes down, headstand, legs up, against the wall. She's got no shoes on. She's in civilian clothes. She holds it for 30 seconds. They said she then began to walk around the little interrogation room and sing a Dido song uh, mm -hmm. and search through the trash. So Mark, what's that about? Well, whenever I've done that, Megan, um, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I should know what that means. That's a nut job. Well, there. is she going for an insanity thing? That's my first thought was, is she trying to look like a nutcase uh, in the most no. serious of circumstances? She's doing headstands? No, 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 no. I eliminate that. Listen, of all your theories, that one I don't like because that would mean this narcissist who has consistently said that it wasn't her, she wasn't there. I was framed like the Mona Lisa. She's not going to then say, I'm nutty, I'm crazy, I did it, but I did it because I'm, you know, I don't know right from wrong and I have a mental illness or defect. There's no way that that's what she was doing. So could it just be she's been in there for hours and somehow in her apartment, she does that? I don't know. There's women who do headstands like that for some purpose, I think, right? Isn't that part mm, of some yeah, pose well, that somebody might Yeah, do I mean, it could have been a stress I reliever. I don't know. It could have been a stress reliever. I'm sure she was stressed. Um, you heard in that interview with Inside Edition, she claimed for the first time two intruders killed Travis and that she was there as well, the ones she would never be able to pick out of a lineup. Um, she continued to claim a home invasion and that we'd been there having a consensual sexual interlude using the camera before the intruders got there. The camera is one of the most interesting things about the whole day. Yeah. They took pictures of each other. 
she took pictures of him post injury, like post, Mm -hmm. at least one picture they say was of him in the shower, like while he was being attacked. And so we have crime scene photos that the police took that show us actually what happened to him. But the reporting was that there was at least one photo post initial injury. How does this person leave the camera there? And I think they eventually found it like in the washing machine. Or- yes, I'm glad you said that. I was getting that vibe. It was either washing machine. I'm thinking back all these years. It was either washing machine or dryer. So I think it was the washing. And somehow the, um, I don't know, the little disc or whatever they use was still good. And they were able to get those photos. And again, once that evidence came in, that's it. She's done. All her stories. But I don't get it, Mark. There. She leaves. She's got all the time in the world. She leaves. They don't find the body for five days. She knows there's a camera with all these photos of her at a minimum with him moments before he dies. Nah, why? Washing machine. Why? She, she why thinks would washy, she washy, it? bye bye. That's what I think happened. Why wouldn't she just take it with her? I don't get it. It's too stupid. Is she a moron? She left a lot of clues and she's serving a life sentence. I wouldn't put her up there with Einstein. Yeah. Junk science. That's what the doctor called many of those fruit and vegetable supplements on the market. Junk science because they use extracts of common produce department fruits and vegetables with few health benefits. But I want to tell you about Field of Greens. Field of Greens is different. They use the whole organic fruit and vegetable, not a watered-down supplement. And it's backed by a better health promise, which I'm going to tell you about. Each ingredient in Field of Greens was scientifically chosen to support vital organs like heart, lungs, and kidney health. Others support your immune system, blood pressure, metabolism, and healthy weight loss. Their better health promise is simple. The next time you are at the doctor for a checkup, if the doctor doesn't say you're looking healthier than before, you're going to get your money back. How about that? That's a deal. So let me get you started with 15% off. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use my promo code MK. Promo code MK at fieldofgreens.com. She gets arrested. She goes on trial. Once she takes the stand, and was it a surprise? Do you remember? Because the prosecution went on for two weeks before the Uh, defense had to offer its side. Was mm -hmm. it a shock when she took the stand? I don't think I was shocked, no. Um, In fact, the type of person that she was, very outspoken, very passionate. I think she needed to. I think that she, I think it was expected. I don't think I was shocked. Okay, because somebody's going to have to say what happened inside of that room. And she's going to have to admit she was there now, thanks to the photographic evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and also, anytime there's any element of self-defense, which is pretty much what she was saying, that she was attacked and then she, you know, had to do something, that that, that can't be brought up by a lawyer. You got to put them up there. Okay. Because she started with intruders to Inside Edition. Uh, She continued with home invasion. uh, And, you know, I was an innocent victim that saw him, you know, get attacked. And then she switched she switched to Travis attacked me and I killed him in self-defense. She, in August of 2010, she submitted a request to the court to have letters allegedly from Travis Alexander admitted into evidence. The letters were meant to help prove her new theory of self-defense. The prosecution objected, saying the defendant argues that the letters are relevant to her claim of self-defense and that she was a victim of previous sexual and physical abuse by Mr. Alexander. But they denied that, and they said these letters should not be allowed. Um, Her new theory was that Travis Alexander became angry when she dropped his camera, (sighs) and she was forced to kill him in self-defense. That was ultimately, Mark, what she did claim in front of the jury, was it not? That's all that was left. In other words, okay, the two-intruder theory didn't work. Everything else didn't work. Then you're left with, all right, I'm there. I can either do insanity, which works in a fraction of 1% of the cases. And in this case, with all the planning and all the, you know, lies after the fact would absolutely not work. So by, you know, the same way I took the bar exam, I might not have known the answer, but I eliminate those that definitely aren't the right answer. And what's left is the only thing I got to go with. So that's what happened. She starts to try to demonize Travis. He Mm -hmm. abused me. He sexually pressured me. He treated me like I was his sexual plaything. I didn't enjoy it. He was this Mormon who, you know, made me do dirty things that I didn't want to do because he, whatever, he had some beliefs that he didn't want to cross. Here's some of that. Okay, we have um, 
First of all, she accuses him of being a pedophile just to set the jury's Harsh. expectation of him, you know, Harsh. where she wanted it. Right. Absolutely no proof of, of that whatsoever other than her weird word. Here that is sought for. I walked in and Travis was on the bed masturbating. And I got really embarrassed. It was a picture of a little boy. Oh, five-ish, five, six. I'm not a good judge of age. He was dressed in underwear, like briefs. I was frozen there for a minute while being, and I just ran. I didn't stay. I felt nauseated. Ran inside and threw up in the bathroom. That's a clip oh. from HLM, which is why there's music over the weird testimony. But yeah, so she tries to condemn him as a pedophile before she gets oh, started. And had, and had Spider-Man pajamas ordered to the house. Like she was very specific. She's dangerous because she's not an idiot. I mean, she's dumb, but she's not an idiot. I don't know what that means. But you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. She's very cunning. She's not a criminal gaffling. mastermind. What's that? I said she's not a criminal mastermind, but that doesn't mean she's um, not smart. She's correct. She's creative. She's, you know, cunning. She she plans these things out. She had plenty of time to to plan how she was going to um, lower him in the eyes of the jury. And and you dig from the pedophile card deck. That's about as low as you go. That was the worst. Yeah. So then she tries to say that she had to give him certain forms of sex because he was a Mormon. And this is what he required of her. I'll let her tell it. Uh, this is SOT 5. Sex is sex. There are just different ways to have sex. And it seemed like, it seemed like Travis was kind of, um, I don't know how to put it, um, but it just seemed like he sort of had like the Bill Clinton version, whereas over here, it seemed like, you know, oral and Anal sex were also sex to me, but not for him. So now she's Jody the librarian, right? She's got her little glasses on. He made me do it this way and the other way, this pedophile, right? So she, this is the defense. And this is one of the reasons why America was riveted. So transparent what she's doing, to me anyway, and I think to the jurors also, but you still got to do it. Uh, you know, you, you dealt the cards that you have. You got to play them. And, and you have a, a horrible defendant. But there's no other way to advance that ridiculous self-defense theory. Well, is that it. true? I mean, if you had been her defense attorney, what would you have done? Not write a tell-all book and get disbarred. We'll get to that. Um, yeah. uh, what would I do? Probably what happened here. I would. Um, it would be obvious, painfully to me, that my client is guilty as they come. And I would say to that person, um, first of all, they might be offering you life. Um, you might want to take that instead of risking the death penalty, try to persuade her that her chances are very low of prevailing. Um, she, the narcissist, would say, I'm not going to be convicted. So I'd go and I'd say, OK. And to myself professionally, I'd say winning is defined by doing everything I can to achieve the best possible outcome for this client. Whether they say guilty or not guilty is not in my control. And so testifying is her option. If she wants to testify, she testifies. In other words, yeah, I might lose this case. And you know what? I'm fine with that. Mm. This is the problem. I mean, basically, you try to cut a deal on it with a client like this because there's just no question that the jurors are going to find her guilty. Um, Juan Martinez was the prosecution. And I, one thing I do remember is you did not like him. You did not still, like the I'm, way he I, behaved. Listen, the main reason why I accepted your invitation is because I get another crack at, at, at talking about his cross-examination. Okay, so let's set it up before before we play the soundbite of that. Um, he had two weeks to present his case. It's kind of open and shut. What should he have done? What, what would you have preferred to see a prosecutor do? In okay, this kind of ready? Case? And yeah. I'm talking to the Murdoch uh, prosecutors. You know, everybody gives both Juan Martinez and those guys such accolades, and they did good things. I'll give them credit for that. I'm merely talking about cross-examination, which is an art form. I have taught my students that you don't wing it. You carefully craft 
every single question that you're going to ask, knowing that it could go this way or this way, and then you are ready with the follow-up. Is it the fact that on such and such a day you said this, and you boom, 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 and it's a lean filet mignon. You don't present a big fatty steak wandering around. Hey, Mr. Martinez, your ego is not your amigo. You don't get up there and make it about you. You don't take days. You don't you know, try to grandstand like he did. I thought his cross-examination was horrible. And people are going to say, oh, you're jealous, this and that. I'm not. I don't care. I wish him well. I'm simply saying that it was a, 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 a D minus on the scale. And I'm telling you this, don't go by the outcome. This case could have been won by, by rookie prosecutors. I'm talking about how he did on cross. Both he and the Murdoch prosecutors sucked in cross-examination. Yes, I've said it publicly. <laughs> Again, yes, I know. I agree with you. And now I have to tell you, I listen to some of these friends of the Murdoch prosecutors on their little podcast, and they're like, oh, people just didn't get it. They just didn't get how brilliant that cross was. It's like, no, people know how to do a proper cross examination. And they could have, it would have been over and done with had they done it properly. They let him go on. There was a chance the jury could have bonded with the guy. They took unnecessary risks in yeah. that cross of Alex Mur I agree with you. Uh, you don't okay, do so it. here's one. You don't take credit because no, the don't guy, do it. either the guy or in this case, Jody looked bad. Oh, look at me. I made her look bad. She would have looked just as bad without the opportunity to then explain, humanize, go on and on. There's no need for that. There's no reason to take a risk on a single question. Good lawyers yeah. carefully craft everything. We think about everything we're doing. These guys look like they were winging it, and they were. That's unacceptable. And you stay in control the whole time. You're the one who's speaking. The witness is just there to say yes or no. That's it. You are the one who's That's, telling the jury the story. With, They're really listening limited, to the prosecutor. With limited exceptions, when I know no matter what they do or say, they're hanging themselves. So every now and then, I'll throw that in just to switch it up because I know there's not a single answer that's going to score points for them. Mm -hmm. Well, here's, let's let the audience get a flavor of Juan Martinez. Here is uh, the prosecutor, Juan, trying to have Jody demonstrate Travis's alleged attack because she's claiming I dropped his camera, then he came for me, he chased me, that's why I had to kill him. Here's just a little bit of that exchange and then I'll play the, the feistier one. Ma'am, if you would mind, stand up, go to the left, and show me the posture of uh, Mr. Alexander immediately before he rushed you, according to you. Um, as he was running. No, no, just, just show me. That's what I'm asking you to do, not talk. Show me. Show me the linebacker pose. He got down and... Well, show me. Show me the linebacker pose. That's what I'm asking for you to do. Okay. He went like that, and he turned his head and grabbed my waist. Just like that, correct? Pretty much. And he grabbed your waist, right? I can't say it's just like that, but that's what I remember. Well, no, just, just, I want, without talking, just show me the pose. He got down like that. Like that? Yeah. All right, go ahead and have a seat then. He's oh. already annoying. Megan, let me add him. Okay, first of all, nobody likes a bully. And I'm telling you, I've actually, during jury selection, excuse jurors, one woman I saw when I was speaking, because I was like, you know, I turned to this woman, I said, you know, you said you could be fair to my client, but I'm really wondering, ma'am, I get a sense that, and I, and I really questioned her very firmly because I really wanted her out if she wasn't going to be on board with the plan of being fair. There was a tear that fell down from her eye. And I realized in what? that moment, I asked her, I go, is everything okay? She goes, I don't know. It's just your energy. Like, I feel <sighs> like you're, and I realized, oh my God, I'm too much for people at certain times. Similarly, <laughs> what Juan Martinez is doing is being so overly aggressive unnecessarily that that has to turn certain jurors off. There's no reason to be that way in a case like this. That's the first criticism. I've got more with what I just saw. Okay. There's more coming. Um, I'll play another soundbite and then you can resume. Uh, there was this tense moment where she got after him for his style. Uh, you know, it got to the point where she actually had to call him out. Here's a little bit of that on SOT7. What factors influence your having a memory problem? Um, usually when men like you are screaming at me or grilling me or someone like Travis doing the same. So that affects your memory problems, it right? It does. It makes my brain scramble. So you're saying that it's 
the it, basically what you're saying is Mr. Martinez's fault that you can't remember things that are going on. It's not your fault. I'm not saying that. You're saying that, isn't it? No, I'm not saying that. Is there something about a certain decibel of the voice that creates problems? Decibel, tone, content, sort of a combination of those factors. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. God, it's so horrible. And the public doesn't understand because they don't see great cross-examinations when they're watching these high-profile cases. I haven't seen it recently. There's been some examples. There's some exceptions. None that come to mind right this Johnny second. Johnny Depp. Johnny but Depp's lawyer with uh, Amber Heard. What's that? Which one? Johnny Depp's lawyer cross-examining Amber Heard. Very effective. Probably. I'm trying to remember. Remember? Um, I can't remember her name. She became yeah, a star. She's now an NBC yeah. contributor. But she did it exactly the way we're discussing. It was textbook, Mark. It was, isn't this true? Isn't that true? And then you did this. And then this. Isn't that true, Miss Heard? Now Your Honor, please yes. direct the witness yes. to answer my question and not, not to go on like this. You know, like she controlled the witness. What's, what's her name, Steve? Camille Vasquez. Yeah, she was good. She was solid. I, I agree. So two things. One, in the first clip that you played, you're asking the defendant now to give her version again, giving her another opportunity to then display for the jurors why she's not guilty. I would never do that. I'd just make fun of it. And the second clip, you look at him, he doesn't have those questions prepared. He's just winging it. That's what a rookie lawyer does or someone who doesn't do cross-examination. It's not to say there's not room for spontaneity, but I plan my spontaneity. I know that sounds like a contradiction, <laughs> but that's what I you do. You sound like it's a great, like a great out. person to hang out with, <laughs> your poor wife. <laughs> not always. I'm talking about not in the bedroom, in the courtroom. Come on. <laughs> and on three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's talk about the fact that your friend Juan Martinez, in addition to the defense lawyer, have both been disbarred since then. They've both lost their law licenses. Yeah. Yeah. Different reasons. But can we back up a little bit? Because we yeah. we left out one of the biggest things in the trial. Well, yeah, I'm not done with the trial, but I, I do think okay. it's interesting that your friend lost his law li license. And I think when people look at that cross-examination, it's very interesting to know, quoting now the AP, um, that Martinez was accused later, this is why he lost his law license, of leaking the identity of one of the Jody Arias jurors he yeah. leaked the identity to a blogger with whom he was having a sexual relationship, then lied to investigators about it. That's what he was accused of. And of sexually harassing a bunch of female law clerks in his office. He chose not to defend the charges and consented to disbarment. And what's yeah. happening? What are you, what are you doing? It's, it's, it's a fog, Megan. Like Jody <laughs> Harris, don't you remember? She was in a fog. What? <laughs> Did you, what you don't think I bring props out for you? Come on. You got dry ice in your office. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a little machine I gave to my son <laughs> for his like 13th birthday. But so appropriate, <laughs> really, when we're talking about the fog and how Jody <laughs> Arias was in a fog. She didn't remember anything. Don't you remember the famous fog? Come on. Yes. She was in a fog. Well, Okay, the lawyer, too. All right. <laughs> kill the fog. About? The lawyer, too, was in a fog as he was sexually harassing all the female law clerks to the point where they were, they had to run. He was staring at the chests of some female employees in the county prosecutor's oh. office, looked them up and down as they walked away. Some female employees would hide in the bathroom, duck into cubicles, or engage in busy work to avoid encountering Martinez. He got fired after 32 years as a prosecutor, then lost his law license. That's the man. I'm going to have to say, tip of the hat, your instincts were dead on. What an unsubtle pig. You know, I read that to my wife. She's like, ah, what a horrible. And I looked at it from her perspective. And and women don't like that. You know, yeah, and, and no. what a horrible place to be, you know, where yeah. where all day long you have this guy staring at you and he's not subtle. And it just yeah. it's just horrible, you know. I know what it's creepy. Well, so you, I mean, I think your instincts were dead on. You understood this is not a good lawyer and this is not a good man. And you had a revolt in watching him that was well-placed. But the, the evidence was so strong against her, it didn't wind up hurting his case. In a startling description, the UN food chief warned the world with these words. 
knocking on famine's door. Say what? He called what we're facing a perfect storm of a perfect storm, and he's not alone. A Barron's report says a food shortage could be coming even in the United States. Farmers see it too. John Boyd Jr., a fourth-generation farmer, recently said, quote, we're going to see empty food shelves in the coming months. That's why getting survival food is more important than ever. Create your own stockpile of the best-selling Four Patriots survival food kits. It's not ordinary food. We're talking good for 25 years, super survival food. Hand-packed in a family-owned facility in the USA and giving jobs to over 200 Americans. They have different delicious breakfasts, lunches, dinners, and you can make these meals in less than 20 minutes. Just add boiling water, simmer, and serve. And right now, for the next few days, viewers will get 10% off their first order at 4patriots.com. That's the numeral 4, patriots.com, by using the code MK. Go to 4patriots.com, use code MK to start your stockpile today. He did ultimately get a confession on the stand, which was rather helpful. I mean, we knew that she killed him because she was claiming self-defense by that point. But here is the moment of confession on the stand when she breaks down Saad 8. Would you agree that you're the person who actually slit Mr. Alexander's throat from ear to ear? Yes. Would you also agree that you're the individual that stabbed him in the upper torso? Yes. And you're doing all of this to, in the, according to your version of events, you're doing to this to this individual after you have already shot him, right? Yes. What do you make of that? Give that exchange? credit again. You, you, Megan, that was her whole theory. She was admitting that she did the abhorrent acts for which she's accused. If anything, mm -hmm. he could have artfully said, all right, just so these jurors are crystal clear, the first stab that went into his body, you did that, not two strangers that you initially said, these two intruders, right? Then another jab, and then another jab, this one over here by the heart, that was you, not somebody else. And then and he could have gone on and on and on about every stab that she did. And then to really highlight the brutality, especially since he's going for the death penalty after. So you really want to highlight it. The best he had was you stabbed him in the torso. Yes, yes. No, 27 times. And then mm. you did this or that, whatever order he wants. That was, you're giving him credit. And yeah, okay, he did that. But again, it was, wasn't the most effective. He lost a huge opportunity. That's a good point. Drive it home. And I found the medical examiner's uh, testimony that I was looking for earlier. Kevin Horn testified about the stab wounds and said the slash wound to Travis's throat was three to four inches deep and went to the spinal cord in the back of the neck, had mm -hmm. two major vessels that had been sliced. He would have lost a great deal of blood very quickly and then lost consciousness within seconds and died a few minutes later. Uh, and then, of course, she shot him as well. But he talked about the wounds to Travis's hands. That must have been before the fatal injury. So the guy fought for his life. He must have been terrified. This person he trusted, who was, you know, he was undressed with, had had this interlude with, surprises him in this place that's supposed to be, you know, inviolate. The shower, my God. Um, so you're right. And, and his failure to bring home the brutality did come back to haunt him at the penalty phase. Yeah, I'm still actually thinking of ways that I would have done this differently. I would have said, I'm sorry, Miss Arias. I see that you're crying. Do you need a moment? And by the way, Miss Arias, were you crying? Stab number seven. Were tears running down your eyes then? When you did this, mm -hmm. were you crying then? Okay, do you need time? I'll ask the judge if you need a few minutes, but I'm not going to let her hide her face in that tissue and put on that act. Miss Arias, can you look at me? I'm asking you some questions. If you need time, I'll give you some time. She's mm, hiding her face. Good. The jurors need to judge her credibility, Your Honor, assuming the judge wouldn't allow me to, to you know, control her that way. I'd go sidebar and say, judge, they're judging. She's hiding her face. I want them to see her face. She needs time. I'll give her time. But I'm not going to let her bury her face when I'm asking her to talk about the most intimate of brutality that she committed. No way. That's a good point. Does anyone have a scrunchie? Who's got a scrunchie? Let's, <laughs> let's get that hair back. <laughs> right. No, right. you're right. There was... That was clearly a tactic. 
Well, the jury yeah. didn't buy it because um, after she'd been on the stand for, they say, 18 days, 18 days between direct and cross-examination, many felt that was a tactic by her defense lawyer to create a bond between Jody and the jury to where they could not vote for death. Do you agree that was a strategy? 100%. And let me just say this. I just finished a federal trial. My client wanted to take the witness stand. My direct was extremely long. Number one, I'm humanizing my client. Number two, there was a lot to talk about, right? Um, number three, um, it is difficult when they don't know who your client is. They, The prosecutors will always call them the defendant. I'm here to humanize my client. And yes, in that case, they want to slaughter her. They want to kill her, right? The ultimate sanction. So that serves a purpose. Kudos to the pro for the defense lawyer, not the prosecutor, the defense lawyer. I don't care how long he takes, as long as it's productive and it's routine. They've rehearsed it all. It's choreographed. She could look great on direct, long, 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 long. Cross, not the same. What do you mean? Cross needs to be tight. It needs to be planned out. It shouldn't go for a, more than a day. And certainly mm. within that day, I'd say a few hours, you can make your points. That's it. Okay. Days? You don't want... Is this you don't the want to Juan Martinez show. This isn't about you, dude. Stop making it about you. You don't want to prolong the relationship between this person and the jurors any more so than than the defense lawyer did on the direct. All right, so the jury gets the case. Uh, ultimately, the jury was read in court. Here's soundbite nine. The state of Arizona versus Jody Ann Arias, verdict count one. We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn, and the above entitled action upon our oaths do find the defendant as to count one, first degree murder, guilty. Five jurors find premeditated, zero find felony murder, seven find both premeditated and felony. Signed, four person. Is this your true verdict? So say you want it all? I mean, it wasn't a shock. She actually looks kind of surprised to hear the verdict. It wasn't a shock to anybody. Don't credit her with having real emotion and equating whatever she just did to how you and I, she's in a whole different area code psychologically. I don't know what that was. I don't. Right. We don't. There's more acting. Well, then, then we moved on to the penalty phase. Will she get life in prison or will she get the death penalty? And that is in Arizona is up to the jury uh, at least on the initial go round, and so the the jury had to wrestle with that. She got to say how she felt about the death penalty in an interview with Fox Ten Phoenix the week she was found guilty. Listen to this, Sot Eleven. I believe death is the ultimate freedom, so I'd rather just have my freedom soon as soon as I can get it. So you're saying you actually prefer getting the death penalty to being in prison for life? Yes. And here she is direct, Brilliant. Uh, wait, addressing wait, the jury. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 no. Megan, come on. That was brilliant. The you like ultimate that. in manipulation. That's what Nicholas Cruz should have done. I want death, mm. you know, for killing all those kids at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Again, Florida. it's reverse psychology. She doesn't want to die. She doesn't want to be a death row. She's going to be the, the queen in, in, in prison. She wants to live out her life. And so she just does the twist. That's the ultimate manipulation for that, I'm sure. Mm. So she she did it um, with the jury as well. Here's a couple of mm. sound bites I've heard addressing them. We'll start with SOT 12. This is the worst mistake of my life. It's the worst thing I've ever done. You think? It's the worst thing I ever could have seen myself doing. In fact, I couldn't have seen myself doing it. <clears throat> Before that day, I wouldn't even want to harm a spider. I'd gather them up in cups and put them outside. <laughs> to this day, I can hardly believe I was capable of such violence, but I know that I was. And for that, I'm gonna be sorry for the rest of my life. Probably longer. Oh, Lord. All right, Two let things. me add on to One, that. One, I'm offended yeah, for her making me feel guilty for killing spiders. Very <laughs> offensive. <laughs> I do. Um, and number two, come on. She's again, she's I see how manipulative she is. I keep coming back to that mm -hmm. word. And she couldn't drum up any real tears either. It's like if you really are 
unjustly convicted. It's a, you you just look and sound entirely different. Here she is. Um, Wait, and one more thing bothers me. I got to get these things off. I'm sorry to keep interrupting. Yeah. But like if I don't, no, no, I'm going to think do. about them later. Please. Mistake. I can't stand when people call like something as complex and abhorrent and as planned out and as you know just gory as a mistake. Right. Twenty seven stabs. Those it, were mistakes. You know? Like like Hitler like which calling ones? the Holocaust, you know, an inconvenience, you know, a minor blemish on my record. You know, like stop yeah. minimizing things. It's not a mistake. Right. That's a good point. Like what what was the mistake? The three inch, you know, cutting of the carotid artery after you stabbed him 27 times, like the tw- number number two through 26. Those were the like in any event. Um, now here she is asking them for uh, well, you'll listen. You'll hear. Slot 13. I've made many public statements that I would prefer the death penalty to life in prison. Each time I said that, though I meant it, I lacked perspective. Until very recently, I could not have imagined standing before you all and asking you to give me life. To me, life in prison was the most unappealing outcome I could possibly think of. I thought I'd rather die. But as I stand here now, I can't in good conscience ask you to sentence me to death because of them. Asking for death is tantamount to suicide. Either way, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison. It'll either be shortened or not. She was pointing to her parents when she said because of them. So a change of heart, Mark. Yeah, how convenient. (laughs) <laughs> I just, that's just so silly. I don't even have anything to say. I think I've said it already. Manipulator. This person manipulator. is a household name. I mean, think about that. This woman is a household name. Most people in America know who Jody Arias is because the media took to this case like moths to a flame. She was the star. She's a sociopath. You can see it's fascinating to see the mind in, in you know, working, like d- doing its manipulation. Uh, yeah. And you know what? It worked because the jury ultimately did not sentence her to death. They were, it was a hung jury. And then they brought in another jury to try to decide. And they, too, could not decide on giving her death. And without a unanimous vote for it, you don't get it. And that's why she got life in prison without the possibility of parole, where she is right now. What we don't know is the split, right? Was it one lone juror? Was it a few? Likely it was a few because, you know, there was a lot of mitigators. I I, I didn't see any of that testimony. But, you know, the lack of priors. Um, I don't want to start naming them because it'll look like I'm being sympathetic, but whatever the defense said, there was stuff to work with here. You know, the crime was especially heinous, atrocious, and cruel and cold calculated and very premeditated. This, the, go- the state had that going for them, you know, everything else, you know, the mitigators, it was probably a couple people said, no, she should get life instead. And, and then that's it. They only needed a few there. Mm, they, I mean, is it true that generally they don't like to give you the death penalty if it's just one murder as opposed to a serial killer or like the guy who takes out his family, you know, something like that. There's that. And statistically, you know, how many women actually get the death penalty? You know, it's very rare. And don't you tell me that looks don't matter and how she acts. People consider that. They just do. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the fact that the prosecutor is now disbarred, and you mentioned it in passing. Her lawyer, too, is now disbarred. What did he do? This bothers me. Another reason why I was I was looking forward to doing this. This really bothers me. So he writes a book, a tell-all, and included in that book are intimate details that she shared with him while he was representing her. He then writes this book, and you know, she's objecting to it naturally. And apparently they knew about it. The bar did and said, listen, you're either going to, for putting this out there, you're either, you have two options. One will suspend you for four years, but you cannot then put this book out there or you can lose your law license forever, give it up. And then, you know, obviously then you'll be free to publish that book. He chose option number two, and I'm not going to out anybody, my wife, who said, good for him for putting that out there. Because <laughs> I'm sure many people feel that way. And I was so upset about that. Because, yeah, do I care that Jody Arias's thoughts are put out there? No, because I don't like Jody Arias. But it's so much bigger than that. 
He is eroding the attorney-client privilege where now either my clients or other future clients feel like, wait, is this going to be the lawyer who liked that guy, that Nimrod? He's going to put it out there in some book to capitalize. And then that doesn't give any confidence when anybody goes to speak to an attorney. I'm really bothered by it. Mm, yeah. I mean, it's amazing that the two of the main cast uh, characters in this cast wound up disbarred. And the third, the true star, is behind bars for the rest of her life without the possibility of parole. There have been some reports that behind bars, she's in a medium security prison. She's been making friends and lovers and tattooing her name on her jail cell mates. Um, Lifetime is actually just now, 10 years later, coming out with a, a docudrama about Jodi Arias and, and the case and gets into some of that, like her life in jail. We managed to pull a clip, Mark Iglarch, for the uh, entertainment of the audience. Here's a bit. A Lifetime original movie ripped from the headlines. Jodi Arias killed Travis Alexander. Jodi Arias. Jodi Arias. I'm Jodi. You know her name. It's worth doing whatever it takes to gain my freedom. You're the worst. We do what we have to do. But not this story. When you get out, maybe you can help me get the word out about my innocence. Sure, whatever you need. I thank God for you. I knew you came into my life for a reason. Based on a true story. There is no question. Jody killed Travis Alexander. This January. Everything you said, it was a lie. I was worried that if I told you what really happened, I'd lose you. It's in the past. Love you. I can't defend you. Did you believe she was innocent? Yes. Was she innocent? Hell no. I feel like you betrayed me. I will never forgive you. Bad behind bars, Jody Arias. Bad behind bars. <laughs> She's manipulating half the jail. Oh Social God. media posts, all sorts of bad stuff. Good casting. I mean, you know, I was like, wait, that looks like her. You know? um, what what happens watch, in a medium security no, prison? I, I, How are I you wouldn't. able to make friends and, you know, tattoo one another and do social media? Yeah, she's probably living a pretty damn good life. Number one, medium security. She wasn't high. They they brought her down to medium. So that's much better for her. Orange is a new black, you know. And then secondly, she didn't kill any children. You know, in the pecking order, she killed a man that many think might have done something bad to her. At least that was her story. So in prison, you know, she's at the top of the pecking order. And with her manipulation and, and beauty, she's probably living large. And when I say beauty, I use that in quotations. I'm talking about objectively to others. I know she's using that for her own benefit. Is it... Is is it possible to have a co-ed prison? Because I, this is where I get confused. They said she met somebody named Donovan Baring while serving time. Uh, Donovan was serving time for accessory to arson in the Maricopa County Jail where they were cellmates for six months. Oh, they're both girls. Okay. Then this duo became really close and stayed in touch afterward. Donovan, who I guess is a girl, and Jody, They stayed tight. Then they were at Estrella, another prison, where this other gal, Tracy, met Donovan for the first time. They got romantically involved. They then say, by their own admission, Jody used her good looks and sexuality to get what she wanted and inserted herself into their union as well. Although they never engaged in actual sex acts together, she once delivered a strip tease with Tracy for Donovan and then often refused to leave their cell when they wanted alone time together from getting them to manage her social media accounts, again, why does she have them, to ultimately officiating their wedding ceremony. <laughs> she did it all for the couple, quoting from the cinem cinemaholic.com. So all of this is documented. I mean, on and on it goes, Mark, once a master manipulator, always a master That's manipulator. That's what she does. And she has nothing but time on her hands. So she's playing all those games. And I too, by the way, found it confusing at first. I'm like, Donovan. She with a dude? Right. How'd that happen? No, Sounds Donovan's like a, a female, and then you play it along and you figure out what happened. I think as an aside, I read she's got something going on with a guy on the outside, and that's easy to do because there's nut jobs out there uh, sending letters, wanting to be with her, phone privileges, right? And then eventually she's looking to get married to get the conjugal visits. That's all going to happen. We saw that with Lyle and uh, the other Menendez. That's what they do. 
It just goes to show you, though, the media is still obsessed with this case. I mean, here we are 10 years later. You don't always do a 10-year retrospective on every case. But I remember covering this all the time. The America was into it and wanted more, 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 more. And here we are 10 years later, and she's still providing uh, material from behind bars. So what's our, what's our takeaway? When you look back and you say, okay, what lessons can be learned from this case? Anything okay. come to mind? Okay, so number one, you never really know anyone. Do not judge someone based upon how they look. And even when you think that you're a good judge of character, you never know. You gotta look at the evidence. So once you get the evidence, that speaks volumes. Don't judge somebody based upon their demeanor, what they say and how they look, which which coincidentally is exactly what courts are about. And that's why they get it wrong all the time. But, you know, the court of public opinion, wait, listen to all the evidence, and then you can decide. But we don't do that. The second takeaway I got is, you know, I can't say enough about this prosecutor. Again, uh, he won the case. Good for him. And by winning, I mean he got the guilty verdict that anyone would have gotten. But his cross-examination to this day still is was horrible. I don't even want to put it in the same category as the Murdoch uh, um, uh, prosecutor. His was not great, but Mar- Martinez's was to me offensive. You know, that that he took a case that was a slam dunk and just took days and days and days to do this horrible badgering, bullying cross. So prosecutors, beware. I'm available. You want to reach out to me? We'll make arrangements to make sure that in a very important case that you prepare and all the questions are right there and you've thought them out. That's what matters. You've got to prepare. Those are two thoughts mm. off the top. You know, the rule is that the jury is supposed to like you more than the defendant. You know, that's your goal when you're right. cross-examining somebody, that they will like you, the lawyer, more than the person, and that the way to get there is not usually to berate them, to shout at them, to telegraph with every question that you have nothing but dripping disdain for them. They know that. They know that if you're the prosecutor. This is going to be deep, and you're going to say it's flaky and hokey, but I think first, for you to be liked by a jury or anyone You've got to thoroughly and unconditionally like yourself. And I don't know that Juan Martinez did. Mm. Well, it's interesting that he did turn out to be a bad guy. You know, he did such a bad job and he wasn't likable in there. And it's it's just always interesting when like the outward persona wind, winds up matching with what's going on behind closed doors. It's sort of a, it is an affirmation that maybe you can sometimes trust your instincts. I don't believe you can't ever, you can't ever know somebody. My God, Doug, <laughs> we need to talk. Listen, I have to wait to see the evidence. I, I, I love Doug too, but I love what Doug has shown me Doug to be. Doug's got stuff inside of Doug and so do you and so do I. That's We've never let out, not necessarily consciously, but sometimes subconsciously. So again, all we're seeing, and I adore my wife. I love her, but I love what I know about her. I, there's stuff I don't know about her and I love her for that too. And I love her unconditionally. But again, all <laughs> we know is what we know. That's it. Turn back on the fog. The fog, the fog needs to come back. <laughs> Mark Iglarsh, it's always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. <laughs> I love having Mark Iglarsh on. He is one of a kind. I hope you enjoyed revisiting the Jody Arias case with us. Tomorrow, we bring you the woman who made it her mission to take down former subway spokesperson and pedophile Jared Fogel. I am telling you, listen to this show. I have not been able to stop thinking about this episode. You will feel the same. I would love to correspond with you over what you hear. Listen to it. Send me an email. You can email me at megan at megankelly.com. Megan's with a Y. Don't miss this show. Just trust me. It's an unbelievable and disturbing story. And the woman who is my guest was at the center of it all. It's incredible. See you then.